Excellent. All right, we will call the city council meeting to order. Everybody stand for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk, take the roll. Mayor O'Connor. Here. Morissette. Here. Alms. Here. Dazeel. Here. Weber. Here. Edkins Hoggett. Here. And Hall. Here. All right, uh, we're just going to start out tonight with a couple of uh, presentations. The first one we have is the YMC Equity Journal a Journey Proposal. We have somebody from representing the Y here. Chris Koss. Uh, yes, Mayor, I think Derek Yeager is here. Maybe Chris Koss, too. I see Chris. Okay, who's going to speak? Yep. yep, there's Derek. I will go ahead and start. Can you hear me, everyone? Yes. <laughs> Okay, good evening. Uh, I think for the record, I need to say my name, right? Chris Cost, address is 385 Meadow Valley Trail, Hudson. For the past five and a half years, I've been the executive director for the YMCA in Hudson, which is part of the YMCA of the North Association, servicing the Twin Cities in Western Wisconsin. Um, I wanna first thank, thank you for letting us uh, have the opportunity to, and my for myself and my colleague to present our proposal to you this evening. A couple of years ago when Aaron Reeves first came to Hudson, I was able to have lunch and share about all the great things that the YMCA does and has done for the community. At that time, I was briefly able to share the work the YMCA had been doing in regards to diversity, inclusion, and equity. So after the last council meeting um, and the motion which was passed to explore DEI, which is diversity, equity, inclusion, I reached out to Aaron to see if he had some time to talk. Um, we were um, able to meet with Aaron and asked what the city needed and how we could, the why could help. Um, you may ask why. Um, well, while people may see the why as a gym and swim, we have a history of doing so much more. The YMCA has been around for 178 years and our pillars of focus have been healthy living, youth development and social responsibility. We have a long history of supporting communities and our promise has been to help strengthen communities. One of the ways we've done this is look at our ever-changing communities and build process and procedures to help us fulfill our mission, which ends in two words. Those two words are for all. So many years ago, we put together a number of our resources and efforts in developing our very own diversity, inclusion, and equity programming for our team members at the YMCA. And out of that, we have developed our Equity Innovation Center. Over the years, we've been able to work with organizations, businesses, school districts, and cities in their journey to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what we'd like to present to you tonight is um, the proposal that we shared with um, Aaron and Mike Johnson last week. Um, so um, the council can actually see that. And I think you've all had that um, in your packets. Do we have that available or do I need to share that? It's, it's in all their packets. I don't, um, Brian, can you okay. share a screen with either Derek or Chris? Who do you want to, Derek? I don't probably? need to share it, I have it. Okay, Chris, then. Okay, if we don't need to share it, that's fine then, too. We can just, you can go ahead, Chris. Thank you. It might be handy for the people watching on the River mm -hmm. Channel to share it on the screen so it gets recorded in the official record. I can share my screen, or if you need to share it from there. Brian, can you give him sharing? Yeah, he's got permission. He can uh, select the screen that he wants to share. Okay. Thank you, Brian. So this is our equity journey proposal. It's for the city of Hudson, dated March 2021. <clears throat> After talking with Aaron and um, seeing what the city, the needs were of the city and what the city's direction was, um, our equity innovation uh, team came up with a um, equity journey, which we're gonna present. Um, and we believe that by increasing, increasing tools and resources available to the leaders of our city, um, it will directly impact the creation of a welcoming and inclusive culture. I'm not going to read all of this because it's a big word wall. Um, the ultimate goal is for the city of Hudson to create and maintain a culture of agility, a community effort that successfully functions cross-culturally -cultur and multiculturally. YMCA and our equity innovation philosophy and approach, um, the YMCA Equity Innovation Center of Excellence commits to connecting you with valuable information 
resources, and insight to help you navigate our ever-changing community and learn, learn ways to advance inclusivity and systems change so that it may thrive. We focus on fueling equity, innovation for greater impact. By equity, we mean the ability to see and remove structural barriers in our systems for people to create equity opportunities. And we look at that, we look at that not just the color of a person's skin, but we look at it as age, economics, education, and so many other factors. So my colleague, um, Derek Jagger, will continue this um, um, presentation. And with that, Derek, I pass it to you. Perfect, can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, we're on and I'll just uh, let you know when to flip the slides there, Chris. Uh, so once again, Derek Jagger and I work with the Equity Innovation Center uh, that Chris did such a wonderful job of setting up uh, and happy to be here uh, with you today to kind of walk through this proposal. So on the next slide, uh, you will see uh, more a little bit about what Chris was talking about is our approach. Uh, so our approach is really working one on one with our clients, in this case, the city of Hudson, um, to really look at uh, a timeline that can move through at the at the pace and at the level and at the entry point uh, that you are in uh, currently. One of the things that we want to point out here is uh, we really look at this as a cycle of learning and a cycle of, of leadership exploration, uh, not um, not a phase, so not something that can be completed because we're always walking through. Uh, so for reference, uh, the piece that we would be in right now uh, is the exploration uh, exploration cycle. Uh, we, we move through this piece into discovery, into planning, into implementation, and then really re into reassessing where we're at uh, and possibly heading back through exploration and moving through this document. On the next piece, uh, we talk a little bit about our principles. So how we do this work. So our work is really grounded in diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, and, and these principles and best practices to include really creating these effective strategies for our clients grounded in cultural knowledge and wisdom. We'll go in a little bit more on how we can gain that within uh, and gain and help pull that out through the communities that we work with. Creating an organizational culture that's really inclusive for all, as Chris said, that's um, in the YMCA mission, uh, really into what we do in the Equity Innovation Center as well is creating that culture that is inclusive to all and creating organizations that are culturally agile. Uh, we use the word cultural agile. Uh, some of you may have heard cultural competency. Uh, we think it's really important to really talk about being agile as our culture is constantly changing within our organizations and with our, within our communities. Some of our strategies that we look at um, is really using an equity progress curve to help transform the culture within uh, the organization. So you can see growing, building, maintaining, and renewing uh, is, is the path that we'd like to follow to really increase that cultural agility and lead with and lead and help our clients lead with a lens of equity as they go into this work to really identify and create these systems changes that we're hoping for. At the EIC, we are really passionate about doing multiple pieces and you can see up here, uh, really leading change. So when people reach out to us, um, they know that they want to lead change within their communities, within their organizations. And we, as a, as a group at the EIC, are really passionate about those pieces. Transforming cultures also, Obviously, if we're gonna lead change, sometimes we need to transform those cultures that we all live and work in uh, to create these thriving environments. Uh, and then also to do that, we need to hear and recognize these voices that are within our communities and within our organizations. Uh, and we can do that by participating in really impactful conversations uh, to, to lead this change. So we had an opportunity to meet uh, with Aaron and with Mike uh, to kind of go through uh, some of the things that you're looking at. And I understand that the council has been talking about uh, how we might uh, begin an equity journey in Hudson internally and externally. Had a really good opportunity to kind of listen and learn about where you're at in your journey and move uh, to make some recommendations that we're able to meet uh, with staff 
uh, last week. So a quick overview is an equity opportunity assessment, an equity agenda, some leadership learning experiences uh, for council as well as for uh, internal staff, uh, and then an external piece, which is the community engagement blueprint. And I'll walk through this on the slides coming forward. So the equity opportunity assessment is really uh, what we would call um, a more positive spin on an audit. Um, so obviously people don't like to come in and be audited. So one of the things that we really turn and talk about this is, is it's really an organizational assessment, which really consists of having dialogue with senior leaders in, um, and with, uh, in this case of the city with uh, council members to really understand um, the scope of the work, current environments, those pieces uh, to determine these critical success indicators as well as identify any factors that might inhibit its success or achievement. Uh, we work then to determine current realities, uh, how, how these goals and of these goals and outcomes uh, to really prepare a comprehensive view of the organization. We use document analysis to look at um, current, current uh, pieces within the organization uh, and then really have some impactful conversations on the next slide. Um, with our with your internal team, senior leadership, HR teams, and direct services um, that are selected as we work through to really um, get a good uh, a set overview and assessment uh, that we we're able to share back then with you on some of those internal workings um, with an equity lens uh, that you'll be able to take action on. The equity agenda itself is uh, is also. Uh, a, a service that we walk through, which can help an organization plan for their equity journey. So it's really a strategic plan around equity that we are able to work with you uh, to come up with some, uh, really that roadmap and those measurables that, are, that will help you along uh, in your journey as an organization. So what's up in your screen right now is really a sample. Um, there's nothing pertaining specifically to City or um, to Hudson in here, but it will give you a good idea of some of the of what a, a sample agenda may look like in working with you. So really, once again, under the growing, building, maintaining, and renewing, we look at some goals, some success, success metrics um, under each of these pieces, and we work with you to build that uh, so you can build your equity agenda in your community moving forward. I talked about some of the learning experiences uh, that we were able to do. And really this can go uh, right and happen right in line uh, while these audits are, well, I'm sorry, the, the equity opportunities and the equity agendas are being done. Uh, really learning opportunities for all of you. First one is what we call a transforming workplace or transforming community culture. And then what this is designed for is the leadership uh, staff within an organization. So the leadership team within the city, uh, and it's an eight hour, eight, two hour session um, that we talk about really transforming our workplace culture and developing leaders to recognize the importance of this culture of agility that I talked about and really to help create a thriving culture within the organization for, for all. You can see some of the topics that are there uh, that are kind of outlined through each process, but it's really a step-by-step -step builds on each other uh, to really understand how to build a more thriving uh, workplace and culture around equity. The leading into the future itself uh, is actually designed for, for city councils such as yourself uh, and uh, school boards, those types of, of, of pieces. Um, that's a shorter version of this, three two-hour sessions, uh, but it really helps, helps those leaders and elected officials in our communities. Uh, you really recognize and understand the culture shift that's happening uh, within our communities so you can be better equipped about intentionally leading and transforming uh, your communities as they begin to dive into this work um, internally and externally for our community. So those are two different sessions that we're able to do for both uh, parties internally within the city. 
the inner the intercultural development inventory or the idi if you've done some of this work you may have heard of is really uh, another tool that we use within the transforming workplace culture uh, it's really a personal assessment that, that measures this intercultural development uh, and agility uh, that you may may have uh, it will include some assessments for so the selected staff group debrief on results and one-on-one -on -one results and preparation for an individual development plan uh, that, that each person who goes through this will actually have uh, to be able to work through with some coaching uh, and really help to set up some of the, the next phases that we go through in our trainings. So that's a really quick uh, overview of the proposed internal support that we are able to provide. I want to now move into some of the external pieces and I will I'll be brief uh, as brief as I can on this but just wanted to make uh, sure that you know as we go through this we are looking at the internal piece as well as an external piece uh, so the the community as a whole and engaging community members uh, to really plan and help uh, this equity blueprint. So we have a, a community equity blueprint uh, package that we actually have uh, recommended for Hudson. Uh, we do a lot of this work in communities. And the idea is to really bring together community to help, help really understand where we're at as a community, uh, really start to think about some issues that we may be having, uh, some strengths that we have, and start to identify that and really start to reimagine what an inclusive community can look like. Some of the pieces that we start with is uh, what we call a community think tank, where we bring together uh, multiple leaders within the community for an eight hour session, all day session to really go, th go through, walk through and start to reimagine and, and understand what a community, uh, what our community looks like where we can where we can start with this work where we might want to take this work from there we facilitate a series of what we call equity innovation labs so they're real life real uh, opportunities where we would work with the entire community to bring in people from all across the community uh, from all different organizations uh, residents anybody who wants to be involved to really start uh, pulling more information out, um, providing, uh, get multiple perspectives to guide the community in the work. And then really starting to address uh, what some of these issues might be for and solve for these issues. So it's a community, the community is identifying, the community is solving for, and the community is moving uh, for sustainability around, uh, around equity within the community. We're also able um, to work on some train the trainer, some learning sessions. Um, so once, once the, the EIC is, is through and working with the community, uh, we don't just walk away. We're actually working with community groups and community leaders to prepare the community leaders for facilitation of this moving forward. Along with this community blueprint, we also uh, offer consultation services so uh, prior to kicking something like this off, you can imagine that there's an enormous amount of work uh, that needs to happen with the community to prepare the community to have these conversations, uh, to, uh, to get the right people around the table and the right uh, movement forward uh, to be able to engage at this level. So there's some consultation services that's included in this package uh, to really get us ready for that time. There's also services after the community blueprint, after the equity labs are completed, uh, because we want to prepare you for sustainability, uh, for a, a steering committee, a task force, whatever that might look like for the Hudson community and prepare that for sustainability. So this goes on um, over for years and years and years to come uh, for, for the community to continue this work. That's a quick outline of the community blueprints. Um, if you're on the next slide, Chris, uh, I just want to quickly outline uh, the next one. 
the, I want to quickly outline um, our investment. Oh, one more back. <laughs> Perfect. So this is in your packet as well. I just want to give you an example. And I know Aaron went through um, some of this for you. An example of what some of these prices look like for your consideration. Uh, so the equity opportunity assessment uh, is around 40 to 60 hours, depending on um, the support that's needed to go through. That's anywhere between 12 to 15,000 for those services. The equity agenda itself is once again between 10 to 15 hours is a flat fee, $4,500. The equity learning, or sorry, the leading into the future, uh, once again is a flat fee, $4,500. And that's the, the three two hour sessions designed for council. The leadership uh, transforming workplace culture, um, you can see there we've identified uh, around 15 people uh, from the leadership team of the staff team uh, within the Hudson City uh, to go through that to at $15,000. And then the community engagement blueprint um, is quite a large um, time commitment and uh, really can be spread over uh, multiple years as we look at uh, is preparing and uh, facilitating and then sustaining uh, is a package at $50,000, which I know we can talk a little bit um, as well later, uh, but in many communities we worked at um, has been a partnership uh, between multiple organizations within a community. We also provide uh, above and beyond any uh, other services um, at, uh, at an hourly rate through there. Uh, we provide multiple facilitators. Here's uh, our main team at the EIC. Um, that covers anywhere, uh, all, all different uh, types of people, all different types of uh, experiences, all different types of expertise uh, to help in all of these different uh, proposed pieces uh, that are able to uh, and probably be working with most of these people, if not all of these people, as we work through multiple different uh, programming for the city of Hudson. So I will, uh, that's, that's my presentation. I can stop for any questions um, if we have time uh, for that. Oh, and thank you for your time today. And uh, as I said, uh, Chris will be on as well. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Chris. Um, I guess we can go into questions. I think again, um, you know, I think like Derek and Chris mentioned, you know, this was uh, something new for both Aaron and I as we kind of embarked down this path, trying to get an understanding of uh, what this means, you know, what the cost is, um, things like that. So we're just looking uh, for council to give us a little additional direction in terms of, you know, obviously this is above our $15,000 um, spending policy. So we need to, you know, look at development of an RFP, but is this the type of process um, that the council is, is looking for. Again, we're just looking for some additional direction. Well, I've got some comments. Um, I've had some trainings with my employers and I've also observed um, some of the companies that my friends and families members have worked for and diversity, equity and inclusion don't happen by accident. Um, the, the leaders have to drive the process and uh, carefully plan and carry out that process. Um, so, you know, if we as a council are serious about um, improving our city and, um, uh, the, you know, we as, you know, as an employer and as in city government, if we truly value diversity, equi equity, and inclusion, um, we must drive the process and make the plan. Um, and uh, you know, I think this type of a process is a good place to start and to, to start discussing it. I'd have, a, <clears throat> I'd have a couple questions um, that I'd like to just so I can have more, a little better background on um, what the YMCA actually does and maybe one of you can answer them. Um, 
so have you gone through this process with both private and um you know um cities private organizations and cities or or is this really meant for a city you know is it kind of just meant for you to work through with cities sure so the yeah the the internal process that i outlined we actually do that with uh cities um private organizations school districts um so we have a track for each that we really uh really you know make we work with the leadership um, to really make it fit uh what where we need to go you know the base the base stays the same but we do change it for those that we are working with so yes we have done cities school districts private organizations nonprofits, uh, pretty much anything you can you can imagine can you do you have any examples of cities maybe around this region that you have worked with just so we can have an idea of who you worked with in the past and the size of those cities yep yeah, yes we do and i can i can send that along or um you know some examples of what that might look like um, one of the re the recent ones that we just completed as far as the internal city was the city of burnsville um, we're actually just completing that work and there's some good video out there and uh, pieces that i could send along um, that you can be able to see as far as the external process uh, we uh, are just working through uh, so this is a community blueprint uh, we're just finishing up working with the city of forest lake uh, right now just in, end of 2020 in, into this year uh, and and the city of hastings uh, prior to that are our two most recent then there's some backgrounds that i could send along if you'd be interested in looking at that that'd be great um, so on the investment portion is it my understanding based on your presentation here that like the first three or four steps, you know, happen relatively quickly. And then that community engagement blueprint is done over time. Yeah, we, you know, we, the actual facilitation of the equity blueprint would be completed over time. There's some quite a bit of pre-work um, that can go into that and that can last anywhere. I would say, you know, starting now through about six months um, to maybe a year time depending okay. at where we are as a community uh, when we might kick the actual facilitation of the blueprint off uh, but that that depends uh, where we're at so you had said that community engagement blueprint you work with multiple uh, organizations within the community what types is that church groups or what kind of organizations are you talking about yeah, well, we'd want to, uh, first of all, we'd start by creating what we call an action team. Uh, so that would be uh, leaders from across the across the city uh, that would be interested in this work. So, uh, you know, we'd want to take anybody uh, in any organization that's interested in helping us get the word out and helping us move this forward. So yes, to all of those, uh, you know, in traditionally we have the business community involved, the schools, of the city, um, local hospitals, um, any higher education that might be there, um, churches, uh, you know, different departments within the city, of course, uh, police and fire and those pieces that are direct serving. Um, so uh, it's quite a large process in that, that that we work with the community to to identify and, and bring everybody that we possibly can to the table. And have you gone through this process with just private organizations, like a say a large corporation or? This is a, actually a community process. So okay. this would be done um, with communities. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So well, I wanna just say, start off by saying thank you to the Y and Chris for um, your ideas and for um, your experience and kind of the suggestions for this framework. I, I do want to say though, and I guess I don't think Aaron's on the line tonight, but I have some questions in terms of what we actually passed in the motion four weeks ago and kind of what we're seeing tonight, because to me, they're not quite lining up. So I'm just going to read you the motion that we passed four weeks ago. It says motion to direct city staff to write a framework to establish the vision, mission and goals for a Hudson diversity, equity and inclusion advisory committee and bring it back to common council within four weeks. So I guess um, I'm a little confused because I love the process the why is talking about. I think it's great. 
I don't think it's what the council asked for four weeks ago, because as I interpret this, we're looking for to starting an advisory committee for the common council. And this is a great community wide project and it's going to lay great uh, groundwork and it's going to take a long time. And I, I agree that equity work does that, but I'm just not sure this is what we were looking for when we passed this four weeks ago. I just feel the scope of it is larger than kind of what we were talking about. And I'm still looking for how the city could create an advisory committee to the common council. So yeah, they could go through some of the steps we're talking about tonight, but I don't think I want to put off the advisory committee another year to walk through this process. I really want us to get this advisory committee set up. And then I think the advisory committee could work with the why or whatnot to try to figure out some further engagement of the community. But I, I don't know, unless I'm wrong, you guys tell me if I'm missing something. I just feel like what we asked for four weeks ago and what we're looking at tonight are just not quite on the same page. And I, that's good insight, Paul. I don't want to speak for Aaron, but I think, you know, in the initial conversation that Aaron had with Chris is we just as staff didn't know exactly where to start, you know, with that direction, you know, so this kind of got the ball rolling and I, and I know that Chris and Aaron and, and Derek had a great conversation to start with. And I think, I think that's just, you know, where this kind of led Chris, do you, do you kind of think that's obviously you, you probably don't know what the, the motion was from the last meeting, but you know, I just think Aaron and, and I think staff is just looking, you know, how do we, how do we start? And the why reached out to us and yeah, that's where it went. Yep. I know. And I appreciate the, the work the why's done on it. And I have a great respect for the work. And I think the why can totally be a part of any process that I'm thinking about. I guess what I'm, I'm thinking is we're looking at a, an advisory board for the council. At least that's how I read the motion. Mm. Is that mm. right for my further council people? I, I think the motion was huge. I mean, it's, it's so large. I think this this uh, approach, having gone through these kinds of things, where the leadership is not involved, and uh, jumping to an advisory committee is not, I think, the best way. I think we have to be involved. We have to be leading the process. So I that, that I pr appreciate that part of this mm -hmm. is that it starts with us. Mm -hmm. And my questions will go along the line is how much are we going to be involved in in this sort of training as it goes goes because if we don't lead it if we don't uh, exhibit it it won't work mm -hmm. so if we're going to drive it from a from a community standpoint the advisor committee may i would see could come along as part of this it may be one of the things we decide but right now we're so far from knowing what goals and uh, mm -hmm. uh stating being able to state our vision and goals around this uh, I think this will help us develop that. And then we could, then the advisory committee may well be part of that. So I, I sort of see this as a learning and figuring out exactly where we want to be before we say, what do we want this advisory committee to do? We don't know. I don't know. In some cases, oh, I, said, I don't want them involved in some of the things that we talk about. You know, it's, it's not, uh, uh, not necessarily germane. I think we need to know where we're at and what, where we want to go so that we can set the committee up, the advisory committee up for success and have clear goals for what the committee is going to be doing. And I think that this is part of the process. And Paul, if I could answer your questions, this is Chris again. I think the, the big focus that when Derek and I met with Aaron was what's the sustainability and how do you get something started to move it forward in the right direction? Um, and I think the, the conversations where you could, you could put a bunch of people around the table, but if there's not a direction, it doesn't lead anywhere. And so this is actually a framework that's worked in other communities and with some individuals that have this. And we don't talk education, we talk learning um, mm -hmm. within this process. As we learn as a community, what we need to do to be a more equitable community. And so the framework setting that up to be successful is huge. And Derek, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Yeah, I might. Uh, the question was asked how how um, council would be involved. And um, yeah, we did design one session specific for council. Uh, so you can help come alongside of this. But as far as the community side and the community blueprint goes, 
traditionally, we've had uh, mayors and council that are right there along with everybody else on all of that to begin and plan. Uh, and Paul, to one of your questions too, I, I can point out, uh, it takes a little while on, the, especially on the community blueprint to, to get to the point we're ready to talk, but we really look at after that's completed uh, is just the beginning then for the community. So we're not we're not solving. Um, we're really identifying, uh, giving tools to start to solve um, on how to move forward. But you know, there's been many different steering committees and task force and things that were really born out of that entire process. And uh, to someone's point, that was you know, really then born out of exact pieces that um, uh, that the, the community has identified that they want to tackle next. All right, everybody good? Okay, well, thank you, Derek and Chris. Appreciate you guys presenting tonight. Thank you once again for the opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you. Good stuff. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Next presentation is a library budget presentation. Shelly, you still with us? I am. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Yes. Yep. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council for the time tonight. I know the library is only 3% of the city's expenditures. So this might seem like a disproportionate amount of time to spend on the issue, but I assure you to thousands of Hudson residents. The library is a very important part of their lives, even their daily lives and a significant community asset. So um, I'm gonna go through a presentation here and um, I, Brian, is it um, okay for me to try to share my screen right now? Yes. Thank you. Okay, does everybody see the um, title page there? Um, it's an area of public library funding crisis. That's what you should be seeing. So um, I'm not here tonight with the, the best of news. Uh, our library is facing a funding crisis and we've hit the wall. So we need to be talking to our partners about what is happening and how we can move forward. So uh, in 2022, if we fill an open position and we partially restore cuts that have been made to the collection, technology, staff development, and if we fully implement a staff retention and recruitment report, which I will talk about in a bit, then at our existing funding levels, our reserves will be gone in July, 2022, and we will need to make significant cuts including closing up to three days a week. So what's at stake? You know, this is something that the Library Board of Trustees will have to study and make decisions going forward on what specifically we will do. But on the table are things like our collection budget, state law, the minimum you have to spend is $2,500. The board will have to decide how close we get to that minimum. We will end up cutting programs like our free summer camps for kids, our STEM classes, the book delivery service. We have to senior citizen living centers, large community events like Book Character Day and Candyland, which bring hundreds of people into the library and closing between one and two days a week. If we partially implement that retention and recruitment report and partially deal with those cuts, we could delay the full impact until sometime in 2023. So I know a lot of you are familiar with the history, but some are not. So I'm going to give a very brief uh, summary here. 2003, the city of Hudson, the town of Hudson, the village of North Hudson formed this joint library. The town of St. Joe joined a year later, and they had a very specific reason for forming a joint library and they wrote it into the agreement. The reason was so we could substantially increase local library funding and hence services. 
substantially increase library funding. And we have not done that. In the beginning, there were already issues with changing the formulas because they wanted to lower the contributions that they initially had agreed upon. But the big hit happened in 2012 when the funding law was not followed. At that time, the municipalities had to have a minimum level of funding determined by a formula involving property values, their equalization, the county tax rate. And when you got to that minimum level of funding, your taxpayers did not pay the county library tax. Instead, their taxes were set at the municipal level, which generally saves money. That law was not followed. In 2012, the library did not receive $415,000 in legally mandated funding. Of that amount, 204,000, a little bit over, was not paid from the city of Hudson to the library. And you can see the other amounts on that chart. That number is significant. I mean, it's more than half of our current municipal funding in total. And people have asked me frequently, well, how did that happen? And the key players are not here anymore. Um, so basically what we know is that that maintenance of effort law was changed sometime in that 2011 legislative session. And perhaps, this is a theory, perhaps that information did not get down to the significant administrators and leaders who were supposed to implement it. Regardless, the funding was not spent. We did not receive it. Um, it was discovered and the communities had to come up with some kind of fix. And the fix did not involve getting that money to the library. Instead, the law was changed. So the legislature, we have 380 libraries in the state and all of them except the joint libraries now have a new law based in 2012 that they follow. Instead of that minimum funding set by that county exemption law, Joint libraries have a new minimum requirement that is the three-year average, which we hear about a lot lately in the last few years. So in other words, the municipal funding level for joint libraries cannot be any less than the average of the prior three years. And that law has really set a disincentive to increase funding to the library in joint libraries because it does commit you to larger increases in the future. And um, that has been part of the problem. And in the library world, this law is referred to as the Hudson solution. So where would we be if that law had not been changed and our funding in 2012 had been paid. If we had that $415,000 in 2012 and the municipalities had increased the library funding just 2% a year after that, we would have over $1.2 million right now. Because that funding was not restored and we now follow that three-year average law, we are at about $750,000 in municipal funding. That's a gap of a half a million dollars. And that is the core of the problem. So uh, I think it's helpful to see what other municipalities are spending on their libraries. This data is um, from 2019. First of all, please note that the Hudson Area Public Library has a service size of 30,000, almost 30,600 people. That makes us the 32nd largest library in the state of Wisconsin. So out of 380, we are the 32nd largest. We serve one third of St. Croix County's population. River Falls is half our size at just over 15,000. And uh, New Richmond is about one third of our size. So now let's look at the numbers. The city of Hudson, $350,000 was the contribution. The city of River Falls pays $869,000 to its library. And even a small city 
uh, Rice Lake with the service population of just under 9,000 spends $508,000 on its library. So those numbers are significantly different. And I know that state aid can vary from city to city and that River Falls gets a lot more state aid um, than Hudson. But that state aid is also based on property wealth and growth in communities. And that is part of the factor that requires or results in Hudson getting less than River Falls. Um, we've all heard a lot about this. I know every time we come to the city, we talk a little bit about per capita funding. And of those 380 libraries in Wisconsin, 361 of them get more per capita funding than Hudson. We're at 2370 and the state average is $54.56. And you can see where some of our neighboring libraries um, are on that scale. Uh, in our library, uh, let's just look a little bit about where our money goes. Like schools, libraries uh, have services that are primarily delivered by people. So we are a staff heavy endeavor. Um, the bulk of our money goes to staff expenses. The second largest category you see there, the $148,000 are fixed costs basically related to the building. Um, our lease is which is technically an occupancy agreement, but for this purpose, let's call it a lease, is $143,000 a year. So of the 360 that we get from Hudson, we send back about $143,000 um, for use of the building. You will see in this um, chart here that there is no slice of the pie for programs. We do not have or use any taxpayer dollars for programs, which is not like most libraries. They do take donations and grants, but they do have some of their budget set aside for programs. So our programs, um, 2019, 2019, our first year before the pandemic hit or the last year before the pandemic, we uh, had 20,000 people come to the library for our classes and events which was a record for us and a really wonderful year that we're very proud of. Again, we did that with no tax dollars. All of our programs are free and they are paid for with grants from the Hudson Area Library Foundation and the Friends of the Library, our two support groups. They do wonderful things for us. But please note that we cannot use any of that money for staff wages, benefits, the water bill, electricity. It's for the extras, it's for special programs and projects. So I assert with confidence that the Hudson Area Public Library does not have a spending problem. Our library has a funding problem. I think it's a fair question to ask if this has been going on since 2012, how have we been surviving and managing during this time? For one, we have been moving money that we use to buy movies, books, uh, audio books, CDs, into operating expenses and cutting uh, the collection. In 2010, we spent $109,000 on our collection. This year, we're spending $61,000. So you can see with the erosion of inflation and that cut that we have significantly reduced the materials that we have in the library. We are doing the same with our tech and staff development funds. Those are going over to operating expenses. We are over reliant on donations. At one point we had reduced hours. Actually, we were closed on Mondays for a while. Those were later reinstated and we actually added Sundays, maybe two years ago. And it's significant that we are using our reserves for operating expenses, not for emergencies and not for special projects, but for daily operations. This is the key point though. We have survived because of our staffing decisions. And the state, the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction has library standards and they are a mix of quantitative and qualitative data that set standards for libraries. And the first tier is a minimum service library, which is defined as the basic level of library service every Wisconsin 
resident is entitled to receive. And from there, you can have more services, which is an extended service library, and then the highest level of services. For a library of our size to be a minimum service library in terms of staffing, we should have 17 full-time equivalents. We have about 12. So understaffing is one of the ways that we have survived these last 10 years. We rarely hire staff at a level that they can receive benefits. And we have pushed down staff wages and we have hit the breaking point. In the one and a half years prior to the pandemic, we lost 17 staff out of 12 FTEs. So that is a big number. And if you're in business or you've been a manager, you know the cost of constant training and hiring. It's very expensive and it pulls regular staff away from their duties. So they're not delivering the services to the community because they're training people. And our job postings, we are not getting applicants. Two of the last positions we filled, I personally went out and recruited and found those people. Um, and that was luck. And luck is not a business plan. Wages and benefits, we did a staff retention and recruitment report. We looked at libraries, basically our size and within a commutable distance. And this is a very, very brief, brief uh, snapshot. Uh, 2019, our librarians were getting $16. No, this is, I'm sorry, 2020, $16.86 an hour. That is for people with degrees and experience. By contrast, um, the janitor in our building is getting about $5 an hour more that's because he's a city employee. Librarians are library employees. And so our scales and job um, pay is completely different. River Falls is paying in the $30 an hour range for their librarians. New Richmond um, is much lower than River Falls, but higher than Hudson. In 2020, they were around 19 to 20. They are also working on um, staff wages and getting those moved up. And they're now over the $20 an hour hump. Twin Cities, anywhere from 25 at the very low end up to 40 an hour at the high end. And in terms of benefits, in 2019, the library director was the only staff member who got any paid sick time. So we were dealing with some pretty difficult um, scenarios there in terms of our staffing. That retention and recruitment report proposes that librarians go to $25 an hour this year in 2021, and that we get PTO and deal with some raises for some of the other staff. Um, the board has been tremendously supportive of this report and they recognize the problem and know that we need to take action. What they did for this year for 2021, despite the call to go to $25 an hour is just not possible. Um, they did move librarians up to 1850 an hour and adopted a prorated PTO plan, which was a really significant and important step. So right now we're just looking at implementing that report. And in terms of what we would do with services, it's not to add anything. We want to sustain what we were doing in 2019. So we would fill an open position and do that report and partially restore some of those cuts that I mentioned to the collection and technology. This would bring our FTE level up to about 13.5 or at 14 at the very top end. It would still keep us below significantly those minimum standards for that minimum service library. And the cost of this is $1.18 million. Our current budget is $910,000. That is using $80,000 from reserves. So to do those things, we would need a 48% increase from our municipal partners. And that is a huge number. That is what it would take. 
We will have $180,000 left in reserves after this budget year, and they are dropping quickly when you're pulling $80,000 a year out of those. We did talk to some of the uh, municipal leaders about various degrees of increases in what we could or couldn't do. And one of the numbers that also came up was 30% and what we could do with that. That would involve partial implementation of that staff recruitment and retention study with the idea that we would need to sustain increases to keep it moving and partially restoring some of those cuts. I met with the town of St. Joe last week and they are discussing this issue and looking seriously at that 30% number. Um, they have not made any decisions. I'm going back in May, but the pragmatic discussion to them was if the joint library fails, they will lose that exemption and their property taxpayers will end up paying close to double what they're paying now. So does it make sense for them to increase 30%, 40% somewhere in that line and then have a small increase to their taxpayers or potentially a huge increase. So that was the discussion that was happening last week at their meeting. So just some numbers here, return on investment kind of things. We have a couple of like hard numbers. There's always that sort of softer line we could talk about, literacy, um, lifelong learning opportunities, keeping families uh, with safe free events that they can bring their children to. These are harder numbers. We have um, circulation data, we have average values of the costs of the things that people check out. And we can put that all together to see what people are saving by checking out material instead of purchasing it. And in Hudson, just city of Hudson, the people who checked out materials from the library in 2019 saved $2 million. That's with the city's contribution of about 350,000. Um, as we move forward, our uh, public library service, the system IFLIS, is tracking the actual expense of every item checked out. So when people get their receipt, just like at a grocery store or Kohl's, it says, thank you for using uh, your library. Today you saved $80, $90, whatever it was based on what you checked out. Um, and then we have the hard numbers of what the taxpayers in the communities have saved. Um, not having to deal with that county tax, this is just five years of the 10 years in question, Hudson taxpayers have saved a million dollars. So what we are hoping that the councils can do is look at those ongoing savings and figuring out what portion of those you can return to the library that has produced the savings. Quick wrap up. I mentioned 20,000 people have come to our programs in 2019. The state's own study shows that libraries return $4 for every tax dollar that is spent. The direct contribution to Wisconsin's economy, $326 million. And I think this is significant. 30% um, of the people who responded to the survey for North Star, North Star Economics 30% said they were likely to stop at a nearby business they otherwise wouldn't have visited during their time at the library. So I think that speaks very well for our downtown business community. If you don't go to libraries, please come by and see us. We're not your mom's library. We're not your grandmother's library. <laughs> the library world is very different. The services and resources we offer Books are just the beginning. And I'm not gonna read off this very long list of unique things that we do. I hope you will take a look at them. Um, everything from the study rooms, community rooms, cultural experiences. Um, we have uh, unbelievable things you can check out now from Wi-Fi hotspots to robotic kits, telescopes, microscopes, lawn games, Chromebooks. We even have an American Girl doll that kids can check out with accessories and clothes and take home. All of these, by the way, paid for by grants. Moving forward, 
bottom line is we need as a community to decide how we get this library sufficient, stable and sustainable funding so we can move forward. We are still planning a stakeholder retreat. If you've heard about this in the past, we were hoping to do it in May. Uh, given the vaccine schedule, we are looking at mid to late summer because this is really important that we have as many people as possible in person interacting. And we're going to seek patrons and community leaders to come together, discuss the kind of library we think this community needs and deserves and how we can come together, what kind of plan, what kind of funding mechanisms would we support to keep this library a vibrant asset to the community. So I am going to stop my screen share, I'm eager to hear any of your comments, questions, data um, that you might want me to bring back or, or send to you for your future discussions. I just very much appreciate your, your time tonight. Thanks, Shelly. Anybody? So Shelly, just to be clear, thank you for the information. And it's a tough, it's a tough um, presentation to sit through because I, I think it shows the, you know, the difficulties we're having and, and thanks for your leadership with that. I guess bottom line, I'm trying to figure out, are, are you kind of saying, hey, if we did a 30% increase and the other cities did, is that kind of the, is that kind of the, the magic number you're looking for in terms of how to remedy this? The magic number is 48%. 30% allows us to start moving up those salaries. Um, we would have to make sure that we are focused on sustaining increases because if we don't do, we didn't do 25 this year, we can't. If we don't get to $25 an hour until 2025 the year, that's not $25 an hour anymore. You know, that goalpost moves as cost of living increases happen, other libraries are raising their salaries, the city, other companies are raising their salaries. So that is the, the one issue that if we go to 30%, we, we have to understand that if it's followed by three years of 1%, 0.5%, we are still going to be in trouble. And we also would not fully restore some of those collection cuts and technology cuts, but it would spare us closing the doors two days a week for sure. Right. And if we did, if we did a, let's say if there was a major increase of 30%, then also given the three year average, uh, it would also follow that the next few years would have to be up from what they've been as well. Is that correct? Yes. There's, you know, nothing you or the library can do about what the laws funding requirements are. So yes, that is absolutely correct. Okay. Thank you. You know, I, Paul, in conjunction with what you're asking, um, this issue becomes much more complicated given that we have other partners. And those partners uh, aren't necessarily on board with a big increase. And uh, I think St. Joe right now, they're, they're discussing this and, and they seem to be moving in the direction that we need to continue to fund the library at the rate it should be funded at. Uh, we get into the town in North Hudson, they have a little bit different economic financial situations than, than uh, St. Joe and perhaps us at this moment. Um, they've got, you know, they still have levy limit issues and things like that. So, you know, the bottom line for all of us is that if if they were to pay more, they would avoid paying a lot more because if they were to leave the joint library agreement, they would be paying about twice what they're currently paying and that would be levied by the, by the county. But it wouldn't be levied by the municipalities which frees up a little bit of levy capacity for them depending upon how that's levied at the county level. But what that also means is that, and this is where it gets very precarious for us, it means that more of that burden, if we lose any of our municipal partners, more of that financial burden falls to us. And that really begins to complicate things. So again, just want to try to put it in perspective. They, the, there are other options out there, legislative options, that, uh, that Shelley didn't talk about 
they're complicated. We're not going to talk about them today, but they are out there, and we are talking with our legislative delegation uh, to perhaps work something out at the state level as well. Anybody else? Other questions? One um, thing. One <clears throat> thing uh, I'd like to also add is that, and Shelley maybe touched on this a little bit. Um, the penalty for being efficient is we get less money. So we get reimbursed based upon our circulation rate. If our circulation costs go down through efficiencies that we have at the library, it means that our reimbursement goes down because our reimbursement is based upon the circulation rate cost. So it, uh, it, it's, it's counterintuitive. You would think that the more efficient you get, the more you'd be rewarded, but it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry, I interrupted somebody who, somebody have a question? Yes, Rich, that was me. Um, well, first of all, I wanna thank Shelly for a phenomenal presentation. It was very, very informative. Um, I was wondering a couple of things um, that I would like us all to consider as we look at the funding going forward and even as to, you know, how we communicate with our partners that, you know, we have 20,000 people using the library every year and that list of services was really impressive. Um, I think that one thing that I'm not hearing as, you know, um, we talk about this or I haven't heard in previous communications is the impact that this will have on us as a city as far as our reputation is concerned when those 20,000 people start talking about the lack of resources at their library the the resources they once had that may now not be here two years from now and and um, so i think it's really really important that uh, everything we do we consider our reputation as a city that has great services and so i'd like to figure out ways that we can get the gap funded here and have a successful library. We also um, need to be a good employer and we don't want to be that, you know, the Hudson has, Hudson Library has already a, a reputation of a place that people don't want to work. And I don't, I'd like to see us clear that up. So we want to be a good employer uh, and our city's reputation really, really depends on all of our services being top notch. So I and would support I, anything. Go ahead, Shelly. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. I just wanted to clarify that we had 20,000 people come to library programs in 2019, but our service size is 30,000. So it's quite large um, because our population is in the 13 range. You might think that our service size is 13,000. It's, it's 30,000 and that does put us at serving one third of the county's population. So thank you again for a fantastically uh, educational presentation for us today. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, um, thanks Shelly. Um, my question is, there was something about levy limits in here. So if, if we would, um, if we increased, would that go against our levy limits? Yes. It would, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. The county has, uh, their library tax is exempt from their levy, levy limits, um, but that does not extend to the municipalities. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Uh, just a couple of questions. Shelly, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, just a clarification, you said 143, um, 143 was, was for the use of the space. Is that all operational costs under that as well? Or is that just building itself? You know, water. Um, oh, water, at water uh, the electricity, that's all included in that payment. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, and... The other question I had was, is it fair to say that the percentage increase by any of the partners would need to befall all of the partners in the current agreement as it stands now? 
they are each able to make their own decision independently of the other. So I was asked point blank, for example, at the town of St. Joe, like this could become an issue of fairness. What if we in St. Joe say, yes, we'll do 30% and all the other partners say, mm, we're going to do 1%. Right. Yes, that could happen. Gotcha. So everybody's autonomous then. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right, Shelly. Oh. What, what kind of time frame are you talking about for the um, the shareholder retreat? Would that be one day, a couple of days? It would be a Saturday, probably. In, if, as long as we could do it in person, it might be in the six-hour range. And we would be looking maybe at early August or late July. Um, and fingers crossed. Um, it is just the kind of event we could do virtually. Talking to um, the facilitator and the foundation would pay for this. It's really hard to get great engagement and networking mm -hmm. at an event like this in a virtual format. So it's so important to us that we could do it at least yeah. mostly in person. Thank you, Shelley, for that presentation. It was uh, extremely well done. Uh, some of us have seen some bits and pieces of this, but you put it together in a very, very clear picture of how we've failed to support our library. And I, Mr. Mayor, I, I, I wanna make sure that, that we have a plan going forward, that, that we're looking at this on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. We, we know what's going on. We, and we agree on a direction where we want it to go. It's the, it's, it's going to get expensive or we're going to have a crappy library, a really crappy library. So that's, that's our two choices. It, well, there's, there's a choice of we can fund it the way we should, or we can fund it the way we can dissolve the library and get funded the way they, at the county level. And that's going to get really expensive. Well, so I think we really, we really need to look at how we, how we're going to pull this together. We have to put some pressure on the other organizations. I, I, we've, I've heard this story. I've been on the council almost eight years now, and heard the same story for eight years, and it's tiresome that we that we failed to fund it with the way we should have years ago, and uh, that we're not stepping up and trying to do something about it. Of course, uh, you know I'm uh, the the well. First of all, I'm in agreement with you, Jim. Uh, the funding issues really, really came to light at a really very inopportune time, and that was as we were coming out of the recession, and we were at mm -hmm. levy limits at the time. I'm sure you remember how all that went. Uh, obviously, the, the problems began before almost everybody that's listening in was part of the conversation. And so we kind of inherited this, and we've been struggling with how to make it work uh, we have made uh, great strides with our municipal partners that are part of the library. They fully understand the, uh, the significance of the financial situation that we're in, and they fully understand the ramifications of not stepping up to fund this and having it go to the county. So the way I look at this personally is that we can pay twice as much as what we're paying right now uh, and ha through the county taxing us and have nothing or, you know, pay a little bit more, well, it's significant, significantly more, but still less than, than what we'd be paying if the county were taxing all of us and have a library. So, I mean, when you look at it like that, you pay something and, and, and have, have your library there or pay a lot more and don't have a library. That makes no sense either. Hmm. So uh, anyway, that's where we're at. And that's frankly, Jim, why the presentation tonight, um, Shelly has, has made this presentation at St. Joe and I don't know if she's had a chance to get out to the, to the town or the village yet, but she will, I know that if she hasn't already. And uh, you know, there's a lot of, obviously a lot of time, energy research that went into everything that Shelly did to, um, to bring that presentation to us tonight. I think it's all very good information and it puts things into very good perspective. So yeah, I think you're right, Jim, and we will continue to do that. I would really like to see numbers for what 
the library is costing um, taxpayers like per hundred thousand dollars in property value. And if we were to make the 30% increase, how much that would increase. And if we made the 48% increase, how much that would increase so that we'd have an idea of what it would cost. So that if, if we're talking to taxpayers, we have an idea of how much it would cost them based on their property values. Sure, I'm, that can be done. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Like I say, we've got a couple other options that we're tossing around also that uh, involve uh, legislative work. So, uh, anybody else? All right, Shelly, thank you very much for the presentation. We appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you very much, everyone. Very well done. Reach out anytime. Okay. All right, we are on to citizen comments. So again, this is your opportunity to talk about things that are not currently on the agenda. Please keep your comments brief. Try not to uh, repeat anything that may have been said by other people. And uh, we can't see you, or I can't anyway, and so I don't know if you are trying to raise your hand to comment. So please just break in when you get a chance instead of trying to get recognized um, and unmute yourself. Are there any citizens out there that have any comments? Anyone like to make a comment? Anyone like to make a comment? Anyone like to make a comment? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next portion of the agenda, consent. Becky. Approve the meeting minutes from March 1st, 2021 regular council meeting. Approve the claims in the amount of $225,575.26. Approve the operator's license listed on the list sheet. Appro approve city prosecutor 2021-22 fee agreement. Approve the request by Nick Jans to hold a car show at Prospect Park on Saturday, May 15th, 2021 from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Approve the proposal from Hudson Boosters to remove or to renovate Field 3 at Grandview Park. Approve Britfest car show and Yellowstone Trail event Saturday, July 31st, 2021. Approve the Military Vehicle Preservation Association convoy 50 to 75 restored military vehicles on Friday, July 30th, 2021. Approve the 2021 street maintenance program and authorize staff to proceed with the advertisement for bids. Approve the amendment to the alleyway easement assessment policy. Approve, approval of the scheduled conditional use permit review for Hudson GNG LLC to operate an indoor recreation facility at 2760 and Lone Street. Hudson GNG LLC. Approval of a certified survey map at 430 Cedar View Road for Matthew and Carissa Woodruff. Approval of the conditional use permit application for Lucky Guys Distillery to operate a distillery in the B3 Central Business Zoning District at 101 2nd Street, Guy Whitehead. And a Discussion and possible action on the final development plans for the Hudson Crossing at 2351 Cooley Road for the Banterra LLC. Move approval. Second. Motion and second to approve consent agenda. Roll call. Morissette? Yes. Did I hear him? Yeah. Okay. Alms? Yes. Dazeel? Yes. Weber? Yes. Atkins Hoggett? Yes. Hall? Yes. Motion's approved. Uh, discussion possible action on speed hump policy and or creation of traffic safety toolbox. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Um, I guess I'll take this one. Um, <clears throat> So before you tonight is uh, possible action uh, in particular on the adoption of the speed hump policy as uh, uh, as uh, 
shown in your packet tonight. Um, just a little bit of background on the, the what's happened to this point on this policy. Um, it originated in the Public Safety Committee uh, as uh, you know, requests uh, have come in from residents and uh, and and others uh, for. Um, how to slow traffic down on uh, various streets in town and uh, kind of lent itself to uh, create, uh, considering speed humps <clears throat> on uh, various streets in town. And so uh, just a little bit of background on what a speed hump is. It's uh, um, not like a speed bump in a parking lot. So it's not abrupt. It's a, a large, uh, um, essentially, ramp a table and a ramp down again um so it's it's more gradual but it's meant to slow people down to approximately uh 15 or so miles per hour as you drive over it um and so uh staff has uh put together a draft policy that you see in your packet tonight um and so uh, the the matter, you know, we discussed it for a number of months at the uh, Public Safety Committee. The Public Safety Committee then forwarded it over to Public Works Committee for discussion. Uh, Public Works Committee uh, made a motion to send it back to Public Safety to talk about incorporating this as a part of a grander, uh, I'm calling it a traffic safety toolbox. So it's kind of one tool in the toolbox to resolve traffic safety issues in the city. Um, and uh, discussing uh, this at uh, Public Safety Committee this past month, um, Public Safety Committee uh, recommended uh, supporting the speed hump policy on its own to come to City Council for adoption, uh, potentially getting wrapped into a traffic safety toolbox in the future. But tonight, it's, uh, we're talking about just adopting the speed hump policy as, it, as a, the draft stands right now. Uh, I think that's probably a good synopsis of it. Uh, if anybody has any questions or concerns or anything, uh, definitely feel free to reach out. I'll make the concerns? motion to approve the speed hump policy, mm -hmm. um, but I would, um, without the um, charges to the uh, property owners um, for putting in the speed hump, I don't think that it's a good idea to charge neighborhoods for the speed hump because, um, it, for example, we may want to put in a speed hump in a neighborhood where there's a lot of rental properties. Well, the property owners, if, if they're renting out the property, they don't live there. Um, so they're not going to want to pay for the speed hump. Mm -hmm. And um, it's going to, that's going to be a problem for, for those neighborhoods. So in the interest of equity for all neighborhoods, I think that we should remove that part of it from the, the policy. Anybody else? I just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in. The one thing that was important to me was that the neighborhood had a, had a say in when we would put something in their neighborhood. I think it's 75% as it's written. Um, and I think that's a very big piece of this going forward. But we also have to listen to our department heads on where, what, how this is gonna look and feel in the city. And I just wanna remind people that speeding is an issue in Hudson and these, uh, this kid that got killed over in Woodbury not saying there was a speed hump there, but there were four of them in a the car that got torn in half. It was a similar bump to a speed bump that we're looking at. So I don't want to create a, 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 a more serious problem if, if the kids are up on, uh, let's say, the Fillmore area or your area, Joyce, and they're speeding and they hit a hump, a speed bump, and they end up in a tree. I don't, I don't want to make this a very, but I just want to keep that in your guys' head that we could create a bigger problem. We need, we recognize the fact that we have to slow down people in Hudson, but let's be cautious of how and where we do it. I guess that's. Well, and to be piggyback on Randy on your point, I think when this came to public works, we really want a whole toolbox. We thought the speed bump approach was too narrow. 
And we really want a lot of tools that people can use, like radar signs, law enforcement, other stripings, bump out curves, et cetera, et cetera. We, we were really strong, actually, in saying we, we think it should be a more comprehensive approach to traffic rather than a speed bump policy. Well, I agree with you, Paul, that we do need a toolbox, but I think that we need to put the speed hump policy forward now um, and have that available while we're working on the rest of the toolbox. I guess we want to make sure that staff has more. I would rather do the toolbox first, honestly, just because I think it's more comprehensive and it gives the staff um, more options. It gives the public more options. So I would rather wait on the speed bump policy until we have more of a comprehensive approach to traffic control. Joyce, I could get behind your motion um, if we could include the bigger picture that the toolbox <clears throat> be also part of the motion that, that, that this policy is to become part of something and then we direct the staff to, to carry on with working on that. I'm with Paul, you know, we talked about it at, at a good length um, in our public works committee meeting that uh, when you only, you know, provide a hammer to a problem, you're going to use the hammer. You know? And so if all we're presenting to citizens who want to report areas that they feel we have a speeding problem and we send them a speed bump policy, <laughs> then they're going to think that that's what they should request. And I think down the road, if we could, you know, and not too far down the road, because we do have a significant speeding problem. I have one in front of my house. I'm very keenly aware of our speeding problem. Um, that, you know, that when someone reports a, an area that they believe has a speeding problem, the staff has a one, one step approach to how to uh, move forward with that complaint or that suggestion, that citizen suggestion. and and the, the toolbox could have a procedure in it that, you know, they, the first step is to present them with this, you know, toolbox. Here's the, the, here's the things that we can do to address your particular neighborhood speeding problem and let the, the resident know that we do look at many solutions, not just one. Um, so, you know, I also think uh, I mentioned it to our, my fellow public works members that, you know, what a gift to future staff, uh, you know, to saving time, because I do think that we are fielding more and more citizen complaints about speeding in their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So if they had a, you know, kind of a procedural uh, policy that they could follow with each and every complaint, rather than I think um, Dean mentioned in our meeting that, you know, it's like, well, we get a complaint and well, we have to figure out how we're gonna you know, address that one, and then they have to look in the toolbox rather than having, you know, all options under consideration at each complaint. So um, I, I definitely could second your, your motion to approve this as is with the uh, caveat that the staff is directed to begin work on the bigger procedure and the bigger policy, mm -hmm. the, the toolbox, if you will, of how to deal with areas that have significant speeding issues. Well, he, he, I'll add that to the motion then. I don't think- Second. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's the motion? The, the motion is to approve the speed hump policy, taking out the um, payment uh, by the neighborhood and to direct staff to continue to develop the toolbox for speeding or right. traffic safety toolbox. So the toolbox is not developed yet? No. So I, that seems contrary to everything I just heard. I'd rather move the table back to public works, but I need, I'd like to see a clearly defined toolbox between public safety and the public works. There's two different standing committees here two different uh, things, yeah. issues to address. So, is that a motion? Yeah, I moved the well, I table, but I don't know. No, you should, so so there's a motion to table. Is there a second? I would motion. I already seconded Joyce's. Uh, table, a motion to table okay. takes precedence. Oh, sorry. I would second the motion to table. All right, a motion to table is not debatable. All those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. Move the table. Or... Motion's approved. The uh, motion is tabled. Until when? Well, I think what Randy said is until the public safety and public, you know what? I'm going to let Randy speak for that. It was his motion. Yes, I think we need to clearly define this toolbox between the public works and the public safety. Because there are two different committees, standing committees, that we got to figure out who takes what up, who does what. Obviously, uh, public works is kind of the physical entity of a, this toolbox. And public safety is taking the issue from the police department or concerned residents of any uh, pending issue they may have in their neighborhood. So you're saying you could table this until the, the toolbox is ready, the full toolbox, toolbox I, is ready? I think so, because we're just we're putting the cart before the horse. So staff could come up with Mike Moraz and Dean and probably Jeff now to get involved with separating some of the uh, the tools that you guys want to provide for any issue that could come up. Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> I agree with me. Thanks. I, Everybody Randy, good? I, I agree and I think it should, do you, get, do you want it to start in public works? Because this is where we were talking about the toolbox. It can, it can come to public safety. I've watched that meeting, I, what you guys' ideas are, but if we get some more of that information to public safety, we can go from there. Here's okay. a suggestion that I would make. Uh, okay. Why don't you guys consider a joint committee meeting? Okay. Exactly. That's, fine. That's good. Okay. All right, everybody good? Approve resolution 06-21, preliminary resolution declaring intent to exercise special assessment powers for 2021 State Highway 35 2nd Street reconstruction project sidewalk replacements. Yeah, that's me again. Um, so if you may remember at the last council meeting, we had a preliminary resolution for the same thing, uh, setting a public hearing date for actually tonight. Um, staff uh, kind of realized that it would be more advantageous to set the public hearings and, and everything until after we have a, a better idea of a breakdown of costs for each individual item from the project, which we should have at uh, our next meeting in April. Um, so we want to uh, reset that public hearing date for April 12th. That's what this resolution does. You're just resetting the date. That's all we're doing. Right. Yep, that's the same same resolution as last time, just set, sets a date for April 12th. Move to suspend the rules. Okay. Second. second. Got a motion and second to suspend the rules. Roll call. Morissette? Yes. Alms? Yes. Dazeel? Yes. Weber? Yes. Atkins Hoggett? Yes. Hall? Yes. Motions approved, rules are suspended. Move to adopt resolution 06-21. Second. Got a motion and second to approve. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motions approved. Discussion of possible action on adopting resolution 07-21, preliminary resolution declaring intent to exercise special assessments powers for 2021, again, State Highway 35 2nd Street reconstruction project retaining wall replacements. All right, <clears throat> so this uh, preliminary resolution um, sets into motion the process for potentially assessing retaining wall replacements. Um, this uh, our recently adopted retaining wall policy uh, was uh, uh, used to identify um, retaining walls that are on the project that are in poor enough condition that we that staff, uh, according to the policy language, uh, believes need to be replaced. Um, so we identified six retaining walls adjacent to private property that meet the criteria for replacement. Um, I believe that three of those retaining walls uh, could feasibly be removed because the, I mean, they're not tall walls necessarily and the, and the earth behind regraded, which would uh, eliminate future maintenance on these walls. Um, so three of three other walls would be uh, fully replaced. Um, and then uh, one retaining wall in addition um, 
has been identified to need uh, some maintenance, uh, tuck pointing, if, if you know what that is, um, or regrouting to keep the wall from deteriorating uh, anymore. Um, just a recap of the retaining wall policy uh, states that the special assessment levels for retaining wall replacement, 100% um, of the direct and indirect cost of the replacement of existing retaining walls is accessible to the property being held up by the wall, whether that's the city's property or a private property. 50% um, of the direct and indirect cost of removal of retaining walls, regrading the earth behind the walls and restoration of the new slope uh, is accessible to the property that formerly was being held up by the wall and the remaining cost uh, would be the responsibility of the city. Um, so adoption of this resolution would just set in the motion, uh, again, that public hearing of April 12th um, and uh, gets us into motion talking with the, the property owners to uh, identify, you know, costs and types of walls that they might want to have along their property because they'll be paying for them. Uh, any questions? Again, this is not a final approval of this assessment, correct? Correct. Yep. You're right, Randy. I would move to suspend the rules. Second. Motion to second to suspend the rules. Roll call. Marset? Yes. Alms? Yes. Dazeel? Yes. Weber? Yes. Atkins Hoggett? Yes. And Hall? Yes. Motions approved, rules are suspended. Move to adopt resolution 0721. Second. Motion and second to adopt. All those in favor? I'm sorry, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motions approved. Discussion possible action on approving the bids for the 2021 Highway 35 2nd Street project. All right, finally one that I have good news on. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the bearer of bad news tonight. Um, so good news on this is that uh, WSDOT uh, opened bids for the Highway 35 2nd Street project through uh, the middle of our city. Um, that was last week. Uh, they got some very good bids. Uh, the engineer's estimate for the whole project, um, not just our part of it, but the whole project um, was about eighteen or uh, $11.8 million. Um, our portion uh, thereof, uh, was you know approximately 3.5 million something like that um the lowest bid was from chippewa concrete services uh, approximately 1.16 million dollars uh so that you can you can do the math that's uh the savings of six hundred fifty thousand dollars over the over the the whole entire project um we did kind of crunch some numbers with help from west uh to figure out kind of our portion thereof uh are we high are we low where are we in regards to uh the funding that we have available um so uh the the, the moral of the story is that we are about one hundred eighty-one thousand dollars under budget which is great um to break that out a little bit more uh the utilities portion of the project so water sanitary sewer actually happens to be over budget by about $187,000 and the non-utilities portion, so the concrete, uh, sidewalks, curb and gutter, that kind of stuff is about $368,000 under budget. Um, so the total over under is that $181,000 under budget. So because we're so far under budget, it's about 5% overall, uh, you know, Putting all the numbers together, uh, staff recommends accepting the bids and moving forward with the project. So moves. Second. Got a motion and a second to approve. All those in favor? I, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Discussion? Yeah, I have a, I have a, I have a question. Um, I think if I recall correctly, we had an alternate that would consider because uh, in the current project, we were only going to be replacing um, part of you know, the sidewalks that actually needed to be replaced and not the entire sidewalks. And as an either an alternate or I think it was an alternate, we were going to consider um, the whole sidewalks mm -hmm. in that area. Would this go towards that or is that part of this discussion at this time or is that a discussion down the road? So, uh, yeah, good question, Sarah. So uh, back before the state uh, put the project out to bid, they 
ended up telling us that according to some rule that they have that I don't understand, uh, <laughs> they could not include that as an alternate to the project. So we ended up directing them to just put it on the project and see where it came out. And so the, the bids that we received include all the sidewalk replacements north of Vine Street. So that's Fantastic. all in there already. Yep. Thank you. That's great news. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? And just to be clear, we're approved, are we approving the Chippewa Concrete Services? Is that what you're saying, Dean? Or is this uh, just approving all three of the bids? Uh, I, I, I guess this is kind of strange because we're one entity of a larger project. I, I, uh, maybe somebody can help me out with that. <laughs> but uh, I, I, would, I would say moving forward with the lowest bid uh, with Chippewa Concrete Services uh, for this project would be what I would say, but maybe Kathy has a different uh, well, idea decide, because of this yeah, complicated sure, nature of this project. I'm sure the state has got to, they're going with the Chippewa concrete, correct? So I yeah, think so far as we know, we, they're moving forward Chippewa concrete, um, just based on, you know, my knowledge of what, what Chippewa concrete does, they have the capacity to do this project. Um, they told me who their underground contractor was and it's yeah, they're reputable. They've done work actually for us at day one excavating uh, that did the Vine Street project for us. So we know that the team can do the work. So I don't see any problem moving forward. Uh, so you're basically deciding to move forward based on the Chippewa concrete bid. The city. Right. I just, yeah, I was asking for, cl for clarification because it wasn't in the motion. It just said the bid. So I wasn't sure. So quickly, Dean, uh, the item we just approved for the sidewalk replacements, then. If it's included to Sarah's point, why do we need to assess them? To recoup well, that money, which we probably shouldn't? Well, uh, first of all, sidewalk replacements, according to our assessment policy, are 50% assessable. Um, so the estimated assessment amount, I believe, that we would be recovering from the sidewalk replacements was about $94,000. Yeah, 90, about $95,000. Um, that number could change kind of depending on what the actual bid was for the sidewalk work that we haven't received yet, uh, those specifics from the state. Um, so obviously that's a council decision whether or not to assess these things, um, but it would be in staff's mind equitable to anybody else who has to get their sidewalk replaced in the city to be re requiring the same payment schedule for for these people as well so all right thanks mm -hmm. anybody else all right all those in favor aye, aye. opposed motions approved Discussion possible action on intergovernmental agreement between the city of Hudson and town of Hudson regarding access control and joint maintenance of a portion of old highway 35. Uh, thank you, mayor. This is a, a, an item that we've been um, working with uh, the town of Hudson on for a number of months now that, you know, pertains to the maintenance and access control of old 35 from stage line South to Hanley road. Um, what it does is basically it effectively is a 10 year agreement which we could review again in five years. Um, we share 50% of the road maintenance costs. Each of those types of costs are outlined in the issue sheet. Um, they include crack filling, joint repair, seal coating, pothole repair, ditch maintenance, restriping, et cetera. Uh, right now the town works with St. Croix County Highway Department to perform that maintenance work. They would continue to do so and invoice us on a monthly basis. The other big thing is that this agreement would address um, access control where uh, the city would control access to property that's in city limits and the town would control access to property that's within the town. Um, it does address specifically uh, the property from the park and ride uh, south to Hanley where we will confer with the town and work out whatever access um, arrangement needs to occur with whatever development may occur there um at some point in the future any questions are we paying anything right now for the maintenance of that road not currently no 
How much do you estimate that that's going to be per year? You know, I think it's going to depend. I, I don't know. Mike Mraz, are you on here? He's down here. Yeah, I'm here. So, you know, general rule of thumb, you know, a crack filling that length of row. And Dean, you can jump in here anytime. The current condition of the road is, is, is okay, right? You probably need some seal, uh, not seal coat, just some spray patching uh, to get it by over the next, uh, you know, three, four years. Uh, any crack filling that would be accrued, you know, probably looking approximately between us and the township, you know, probably three to five thousand dollars per entity for that over the next, you know, three, four years. Um, you know, your major costs are going to be when you when you try to seal coat it. That's obviously going to be a lot higher, but I don't foresee that road being seal coated for, you know, at least several, you know, five to six, seven years out. Uh, striping minimal costs, you know, a thousand, two thousand dollars. So. Uh, not looking at a, a great deal of expense, at least for the first, you know, several years. Okay. Yeah, Thank Mike, you. I think you're in the ballpark for, for those costs there. And it wouldn't be every year that you crack fill and stripe and that kind of thing either. So it's kind of a, you know, every other year or so. Mike, I have a question. Is this uh, similar to the agreement that we have with Town of Hudson, I believe for, is it Tower Road? That we have that'd, be town, that'd be the town of Troy. It's town similar. of Troy. Kathy, yeah, Kathy, can you speak to that? Well, the town of Troy was a couple things. It was sharing um, the some construction. There was a project going on, and the town and city shared costs on that. And I think they had ongoing maintenance maybe for five years after that. I'm not certain. Um, so it's similar, but different in that that addressed a specific construction project primarily on that road so this doesn't address that it just addresses sharing maintenance and determining access control which is important um, for both both municipalities to uh, maintain access control and design for property in the city and property in the town thank you um, I'll move to approve. Second. Got a motion, second to approve. Discussion. Yeah, I have, I have a, a comment or question that actually refers to both this and the following one uh, concerning the, the Carmichael agreement. Um, my opinion, I guess, is that the standards for road maintenance and for snow plowing for the between the town of Hudson and town and the city are different. And will this improve the conditions of the roads? Carmichael is a prime example of a road that's been has a tremendous amount of traffic and is under maintained and under plowed. So, will the sta are the standards going to change? This is is it going to get better? Because we're going to be paying more money, paying our money now. I'm hoping that I it has to get better. I think it's, I think our hope would be, and I think the town would be too, is that you know we we start to formalize these agreements as opposed to kind of in the past where they haven't been memorialized like this. Um, yeah. I okay. think we want to work together, and I think that's been kind of the the motto that we've been operating under as we've kind of gone through these discussions is that hey, let's work together, let's figure it out so it works for everybody and make a situation you know better for for all of our constituents. So yes. Yeah. Everybody good? All those in favor? Oh, didn't we have a motion? Aye. 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 Okay. Bill moved to it. Yeah. yeah. Mo oh, okay. Motion's approved. Discussion possible action on an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Hudson and Town of Hudson regarding the ownership, annexation, jurisdiction, and access control of the portion of Carmichael Road from Vine Street on the north to Highway 94 intersection on the south. So pretty similar, but also a little bit different. Um, we talk about, uh, in this one specifically more so, the terms the same, 10-year agreement, review in five. Uh, but this one really gets into transfer of ownership, whereby the town and the city work together. Uh, we work with the town to convey the ownership that they have and the interest that they have um, in this segment of right away from Vine, actually a little bit of Vine east of Carmichael, as well as um, from Vine south to I-94. 
Uh, currently, the, the town owns a, a, a majority of that, um, down to uh, about you know the area that we're talking about, uh, the annexation approval uh, with Hudson Physicians tonight. So again, um, we're talking about hey, we'll, let's work together to 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 start working on that conveyance of um, ownership of that right of way. Uh, we would then take over for full control in terms of maintenance and, and improvements and things like that. But we would also, uh, if the town needs or their residents or um, somebody on the town side needs um, access or some sort of improvement, that we would work with them to accommodate that. Um, understanding that, you know, while we might own the, the, the right of way, that we would not annex property that would create some sort of island um, to the city or, uh, you know, something that's uh, just out there a little bit. So we wanted to kind of clarify that, make that a, um, a piece of this agreement. Um, other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Um, if there's any questions, I'll entertain those. I move we approve. Second. Yeah, a motion second to approve. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motions approved. Discussion of possible action on an annexation agreement between the City of Hudson, Rock Island Land Company, Inc., and Hudson Physicians, SC, for parcel 020-1084-00-000, as and 020-1404-1400. It would be easier if they were just addresses, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be. <laughs> um, so this is uh, that six and, or 16 and three quarter acres property that we discussed uh, when we approved or when the council approved the pre-annexation agreement uh, with Hudson Physicians. Since that time, we have uh, gone through both our capital cost study as well as our budget analysis or budget study analysis. Um, in front of you, you'll see an agreement that um, effectively references all those things and, and the council should be, you know, somewhat familiar with um, all the components of the agreement, including payment of tax to the town, uh, what the intention of Hudson Physicians is as the purchaser and developer of this property. Um, goes into, again, a, a concept uh, plan of what they're currently looking at, as well as um, our updated capital cost study, which I uh, sent to the council uh, this morning. Um, it's been a, a, an exciting project to work on. I think it's going to be an incredible um, addition to the city. Um, obviously, we're going to keep moving forward, and you know, ultimately, we got to go through all the other entitlement processes, including platting, zoning, conditional use permits, uh, and then ultimately, development agreement that will, you know, lay out um, some additional um, uh, requirements um, that they'll have to meet. But with that, again, I know it's um, it's fairly detailed, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to to take those. Move to approve the annexation agreement. Okay. Got a motion and second to approve discussion. Yeah, I, in, in looking at all the uh, all the documents, what comes to mind is what's not covered. What is the city going to end up paying for to have this happen? Is there anything, or is this all the costs that are listed going back to Hudson Physicians as part of this development? That's that's a lot of. So two million dollars, two and a half million dollars of infrastructure that's listed there, and, and there's some things that are not included. Yeah, so obviously they're responsible for all their on-site costs, right? So um, what we'll do, and, and obviously that's a high number you see in that capital cost study. That number probably will come down if we work through. Um, they'll probably do private design of this work. We'll oversee the construction of it. Um, but they're they're certainly aware. We've we've been in in constant conversation and dialogue with the with the group, the development group, and 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 I think you know the initial costs were actually almost a million dollars higher um, than what we arrived at here. So they're aware, and we're working with them, and we're certainly um, trying to make sure that it's a um, that it's a, a fair process and a fair cost to to that group. Okay. The other the other question when we did the Bella Rose development, there was a lot of question and concern about the 
uh, sewer capacity about pumping stations. Mm -hmm. um, does this work for this issue? Do we are we going to have an issue because of this, or do we have the capacity and and that we don't the city doesn't end up having to pay the pay for this? Yeah. Um, you know, if you remember the capital or the, um, oh gosh, the sanitary sewer master plan study that KIPP had done that, you know, with some of those improvements that we have listed in there that we, you know, we're good as a city until a population of, I want to say 25,000 or 2040 on the capacity side. Uh, this one's a little bit different too, Dean. I'm not going to put my engineering hat on today, but uh, you know, this one is, is, is a much closer to our main interceptor line that runs through the old golf course in Carmichael Ridge. So it's a little bit different than um, having a, the special lift station that we had for the Atwood property that they had to install on their own dime. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I can chime in too for just a second. Um, the sanitary sewer study included assumptions for development and, and particularly in this area uh, for development, you know, the, the northwest uh, or sorry, northeast corner of the exit two interchange essentially. And, and that uh, development, you know, fed into the, the, the map of different improvements that needed to be made by like 2025 and 2030 and 2040 and that kind of thing. And this, this development is, is, uh, is is nothing that we had out of that wasn't expected with that study essentially i guess you could yeah. say so um we feel that we're we're good at least at this point and once you start you know getting to developing the rest of that corner of the interchange then you know some of those uh assumptions that we would need to do by 2025 might start getting closer to being realized uh but uh but as of right now for this development, we're not quite there yet, we think. And we've got a good playbook, I think, too, on both water and sewer. And I guess my final question would be on the uh, Carmichael uh, Hillcrest intersection. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's not much, I mean, there's really basic, it's a really basic diagram. So I assume there's going to be a lot more work done on to fine tune that. Like, I, I don't see a, a, a southbound left turn lane. And it may be there, but I just can't see it on the uh, uh, yeah. on there. So there's a, there's a lot of work that hmm? I assume is a lot more detail, hmm. and as well as pedestrian crossing. There you go. So they're, they're putting a four foot sidewalk in, which is well, that's in the cost, but that's 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 not even it should be a five foot sidewalk as a minimum. But then how do you get pedestrian access to that across that that particular stretch? That's a that's an issue that we're going to have to deal with. So yeah. just want to make sure that these, you know, that there is going to be more work, much more fine tuning of, of that particular part of the, of the project. 100%. Absolutely. We are, you know, we are so early on this. I mean, it is strictly that it's a concept. Um, but um, I mean, Dean, I think Dean and, and Dave Schofield with FEH and myself, we have another meeting with their design team um, this Friday. So yeah, we're, we're working on it. Yeah, it's a good concept, and I like the design. What I what they have there. Anybody else? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Motion is approved. Discussion and possible action on ordinance 09-21, approving a petition for direct annexation by unanimous approval from the town of Hudson to the city of Hudson annexing parcel 020-1084-000-020-1083-90-000 and 020-1404-14-000 petition by Hudson physicians. Move to suspend. Second. Got a motion and second to suspend the rules. Roll call. Alms. Or sorry, Marset? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Dizio? Yes. Weber? Yes. Atkins Hoggett? Yes. Hall? Yes. Uh, Motion is approved. Rules are suspended. Anybody? Move to adopt 9 21. Yeah. Second. Motion and second to adopt uh, discussion. All those in favor? 
Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. City attorney approval. Uh, thanks again. Um, we discussed this at finance committee too, but uh, obviously we solicited, um, we put out an RFP for uh, our city attorney services. Uh, we received one response from Eckberg Lammers and attorney Nicholas Vivian. Um, we're not surprised that we only received one uh, proposal uh, for this service as a lot of our area law firms um, might have conflicts, whether that we're um, in litigation with them or represent some of our neighboring communities. Um, also, you know, some of the, the firms that we reached out to on the Minnesota side of the river uh, don't practice um, in Wisconsin. And then our geography in the Wisconsin side tells us that if we want an attorney here um, at all of our meetings, um, we need somebody close by. Madison probably isn't going to cut it. I would um, say that, um, you know, I, I think that we'll be well served by, by Mr. Vivian and his, and his team over there. Um, uh, like I mentioned at finance, it'll be, it'll be nice to have an attorney um, that's somewhat familiar with the process. Selfishly, obviously, I deal with Nick on some of the development related work, uh, which he has listed in his conflicts of interest statement. Um, uh, it fits within the uh, 2021 budget amounts for the city attorney. That proposal does. Finance committee um, asks that we explore also uh, looking at the uh, retainer arrangement with, with Eckberg Lammers. So um, we're happy to do that as well. Um, so finance recommends approval as well as staff. Move to approve. Second. Got a motion second to approve. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Congratulations, Nick. Uh, I got to say, I know that you're used to seeing or being part of our, our hearings here, our city council meetings, but <laughs> you're looking particularly tired tonight. <laughs> it's a late night. <laughs> yeah. All right. Welcome aboard, Nick. No, thank you all. I really appreciate it. Welcome aboard. Good to have you in here. Uh, approve resolutions for the issuance and sale of general obligation bonds and promissory notes for the 2021-2022 CIP. Good evening, Hello, Council. Peter. Yep, Sean is here from Ellers to be able to answer any questions you have. Hey, Sean, how you doing? Good, Mayor. Good, uh, good evening, Council. Good evening, staff, everyone. Uh, we had two reports in the, uh, in the packet and as uh, you stated, Mayor, in the introduction, they are a finance plan for streets, parks, and other capital equipment. Per state law, they're broken into two issues based on uh, what state law allows in terms of the financing for the project. So the streets and parks are in a bond issue and the other projects are in a in the note issue. The um, one area that I wanted to highlight for the council is we've worked with Allison over the last couple of years on, uh, well, since 2019 with the last financing about a continued model of financing every other year. And also with the goal of maintaining the overall debt levy and this is net of some offsetting expenditure or offsetting revenues, excuse me, at approximately 2,350,000 in total principal and interest payments that would be on the, uh, on the budget and spread over the tax base of the city. This plan for this year keeps us on track with that for the levy next year, 22 and the following year 23 and then the debt falls after that uh, in terms of allowing for capacity should the city have additional CIP, CIP projects which you likely will in the um, in the future years while maintaining that target of right around the 2 million 350 so in other words the projects scheduled for financing this year uh, can be financed in a way that the debt levy will not be expected to be above the current levy for 2021. Uh, Timeline-wise, the project 
financing plan. Tonight is the initial resolution approval and questions from the city council. Uh, approximately a month from now at your second meeting in April, we would solicit the competitive proposals and bring that back for review of the council. Interest rates remain uh, very, very good. It's a very advantageous time to be doing long, uh, long-term debt like this. And finally, we will be going through the process of updating the city's outstanding bond rating as part of this financing plan. The city has an excellent AA2 rating currently. Uh, we'll keep pushing to try to get us up at that next level, AA1, and we'll report back to the council as we get closer to the sale date about uh, if we're able to hopefully encourage them to view us a little bit more positively and uh, get us up to that next level. But uh, Mayor, uh, thanks. I, I just wanted to give a brief overview. I, at this point, I guess I'll stop and happy to answer any any questions that yourself or the council might have. Sounds good, Sean. Thanks. Anybody? Any questions? Move to suspend the rules. Second. Second. We got a motion and a second to suspend the rules. Roll call. Marset. Yes. Holmes. Yes. Dazeel. Yes. Weber. Yes. Atkins Hoggett? Yes. Hall? Yes. Motions approved, rules are suspended. Move to adopt resolution number 8-21. Second. Second. Got a motion and second to adopt. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motions approved. Do we have to uh, suspend the rules again for each one, Mr. Mayor? Oh, that's uh, okay. Oh, wait a second. Yeah. Yeah. Mean, okay. Yep. Move to, move to suspend the rules. Second. Got a motion and a second to suspend the rules. Roll call. Marset. Yes. Alms. Yes. Dazeel. Yes. Weber. Yes. Adkins Hoggett. Yes. And Hall. Yes. Motions approved. Rules are suspended. Move to adopt resolution number 9-21. Second. Got a motion and a second to approve. Discussion? All those um, in Didn't we just... There's okay. four of them, Joyce. There's four of them, okay. Nine, 10, eight, nine, 11. 10, 10, 11. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm sorry, so any discussion there? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Move to suspend the rules. Second. second. Motion and second to suspend the rules. Roll call. Marset. Yes. Alms. Yes. Dazeel. Yes. Weber. Yes. Atkins Hoggett. Yes. Hall. Yes. Motion's approved. Rules is suspended. Move to adopt resolution 10-21. Second. We got a motion and a second to approve discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. I can do this all day. Move to suspend the rules. <laughs> <laughs> second. Second. We got a motion and a second to suspend the rules. Roll call. Marset. Yes. Alms. Yes. Dazeel. Yes. Weber? Yes. Atkins Hoggett? Yes. Hall? Yes. Motions approved. Rules are suspended. Move to adopt resolution 11 21. Second. Got a motion and a second to adopt. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motions approved. Closed session. The council may go into closed session under Wisconsin statute 19.85 sub 1 sub G to confer with legal counsel for the governmental body who is rendering oral or written advice concerning strategy to be adopted by the body with respect to litigation in which it is or likely to become involved. Elkin versus City of Hudson. <laughs> we are back in open session. We have a motion. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. Got a, got a motion and second to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. We stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody.